Hi, Nonprofit Connect members. As part of our Nonprofit Coffee Break series, we sit down with a nonprofit professional every month over a cup of coffee to chat about their experience and also highlight their organization in the nonprofit sector in Kansas City. Today, I am so excited to be sitting here with Roxanne Hill, Executive Director of the Rainier Family Wonderscope Children's Museum of Kansas City. Welcome, Roxanne. Glad to have you here. Thank you. It's good to be here. Yes. So we are going to get started with a few questions for Roxanne. So we'll start easy and get intense, more intense as we go. So can you please tell us about the Rainier Family Wonderscope Children's Museum, Kansas City, and your role there. Sure, it's a long name. So Wonderscope is a children's museum and our mission is to spark a lifelong love of learning through the universal and uniting power of play. So we understand and we know that children learn through play, mm -hmm. their brains develop through play, their social emotional skills, gross motor, cognitive skills all develop through play. So we create an environment um, that has just hands-on experiential elements all built around the concepts of STEAM, mm -hmm. so science, technology, engineering, arts, math, social, emotional development, um, to allow children just to develop and to do it through play. And your role there specifically? My role is um, I am the executive director of Wonderscope, so um, I have the good fortune of overseeing everything that happens within the walls of the museum. Um, all of the folks that come in, all the folks that work for us. Um, I help obviously as a, an executive director work with um, fundraising and with the board, um, but really I'm, everybody else does the hard work. I just kind of walk around and <laughs> make sure it's all being done. On what day have you felt proudest of your work at the Children's Museum or as a nonprofit professional? So for the museum itself, you know, we just built a brand new museum and closed out a, a huge capital campaign. So, and all of this happened in the midst of a pandemic. So we were, we'd started construction and we we're going along in our old building and then pandemic hit, we closed down and um, we're then just trying to work out, could we even make it to the finish line? But fortunately construction was um, an essential service. So construction continued. So I would say October 23rd, when we officially opened the doors, we had folks there, we got the ribbon, and then kids came into play. I think, I would say it's a, it was a mixture of just relief, but also pride, because it is a, just a beautiful, amazing building that took us a long time to get there, um, but we did, and we were able to open really up against the, the weirdest circumstances ever. Well, yes, what a big day. It's beautiful on the outside and the inside, so. What is the biggest challenge you face in your role? I think the biggest challenge is particularly um, at the museum because you know the exhibits are the exhibits and they're there and they're built um, but we need people to maintain the exhibits and then we do a lot of programming and so we need people to lead the programs we need people to run the museum so it's the human capital of um, of the business that is always the challenge and we we went from in our old building 12 people we had 12 people working for one scope we now have 38 so that was a significant jump from when we closed in March all the way to when we opened in October. We had to go from 12, ramp up and hire different people, onboard them, try to um, you know, wrap them around the culture that we had created at Wonderscope and try and expand that to all these different folks. Um, and so that's, that's the challenge and really trying to, as everyone comes in, help them understand what it is that we're trying to do at Wonderscope and what our culture is and what words we use and how we, we speak to all of our friends, everyone that walks in as a friend. Um, and so try to use the positive language as our friends are running. We don't say, stop running friends. We say, walking feet friends. And how, how do we teach everybody that as we're trying to open and we're running the business? And then we had all of the uh, COVID restrictions. So we had all this extra cleaning, we had masks, we were asking everybody to wear masks, and then we were, could only open for a couple hours for a limited number, close, clean everything, and then open again. So it was just getting everybody up to speed and on board and understanding the importance of just little things are really important when you're dealing with, uh, particularly with kids. Um, that's probably the biggest challenge on any given day. Uh, having been there myself, I there are a lot of staff members. Um, so in each section, there's one or two staff members kind of making sure, as you said, the children are being safe. And um, as, a, as an adult there with a child, it was very comforting to see that there were staff there um, disciplining all the kids, not just mine. <laughs> if people were getting a little too excited at the fountains or splashing water or whatnot. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, hasn't kids fall into that water. Oh, so, my. Yeah, <laughs> so that's kind of the message every morning. Let's, not, let's catch them. 
mm -hmm. um, before they go all the way in. Good. Good plan. <laughs> okay, what is a trend you see in the nonprofit community that excites you or concerns you and why? The trend that I see in nonprofit is that there is now an expectation or an understanding that it's still a business. It's we're running a business, it's just a not for profit business. And that we still have to, we're all professionals, and everyone that works in a nonprofit is a professional. They know what they're doing, they're good at what they do, um, just like a for profit organization. Yes, we have a mission that we follow, but we're still professionals and we're showing up and we're working in a professional manner. So, understanding that that we're a we're professionals and so we need to be earning a professional uh, wage but also I think years ago it was you know nonprofits had to have the worst computers the the crappiest desks and you know everything had just was the worst now they're saying but well, you're a business we want to see that you're viable and can you sustain um, and I've seen this in the last maybe 10 years and so understanding that it's okay for us to have decent furniture and have a, a, a you know pretty new laptop and printers that work and things, materials that look like you actually spent some time and some money on it. it didn't have to be just photocopied flies that you could hand out. So that, that I think is a really positive trend because we really are professionals and we do want to portray um, our business um, as just that, and uh, as you know, serious business that just isn't working for a profit. How is the museum addressing local and national concerns in regard to racial equity? Yeah, racial equity is, um, is really interesting, particularly for, for us. One of the big things that we did um, when, we were, when we started um, looking at moving, we, had, we did a feasibility study and we were asking people like, where did it make sense for us to be um, and how much do they think they would support? And the big thing we knew ourselves was our location at the time was in this tucked away little corner in Shawnee, in Johnson County, um, and very homogenous um, membership and, and um, visitorship in the museum. And there was no public transportation. So if you didn't have a vehicle, you couldn't get to us. And so we, our biggest focus was we want everybody that can come into the museum to come into the museum. So we were trying to put in programs ourselves um, that would support that. So we uh, joined the Museums for All, which is a national initiative um, with uh, the Library and Museum Services that you can, if you have SNAP or EBT benefits, you can come in for $3 for up to six people. We expanded what we call our Wonder Fund, where we were providing funds to Title I schools for field trips that we would cover. We expanded that and said to, the, to families, if you have a child that's you know, getting the free and reduced lunch at these Title I schools, show us that letter and you can get a membership for $5 and that will, it's up to however many, many kids in your family for a year. So we were putting those initiatives in place to try and, and do that outreach. Um, and then when we were looking around, we knew, and when we settled on Red Bridges um, in South Kansas City as our new location, we knew where we were sitting was going to provide that diversity. We're part of the center school district. Hickman Mills is not far from us. Grandview is not far from us. Uh, Casey Public Schools. We knew the diversity that surrounded the, the neighborhood that we were in. And we felt we were pretty central, right off of the highway, so close to the Kansas side. We're going to be easier, easier access for the east part of Kansas City as well as the north. And so that was first and foremost. So we knew we needed to have, be accessible. Then we wanted to make sure that we have public transportation. So we have three bus, buses routes that go all around us. Um, so that was the other element. And then we needed accessibility throughout the museum so that um, regardless of their physical abilities, uh, kids or parents could walk through, could get through the museum and experience all of the elements. Um, and so then we continue to, uh, with our Wonder Fun program and our IMLS, then we also created a kindergarten readiness program that we just launched in Spanish because we also knew that was a need. So we continued to do those. We made sure that we looked at the diversity of our staff and we tried really hard to, um, to, to address that um, as well because we wanted the folks in the museum to look like the community that we were serving. I think within the first you know, week of opening, we could see the change in diversity um, that was on the floor of the museum. And it's really, really great to see as I walk through. It's just fabulous to see. I love that. In the, the change of location, it is very easy to get to from the highway. <laughs> it's very fast turn off. There it is. <laughs> Big, bright colored building, easy to find. Absolutely. <laughs> 
I think for Wonderscope, our call to action would be that a children's museum is only ever as strong as the community that supports it. Uh, we are a community resource. We're here to support children and their development. Children learn through play. They develop through play. Their brains develop through play. It's important for their parents to be working with them through this development. And a children's museum provides those opportunities in just a stress-free, fun environment. Um, and without support, we can't continue to offer programs uh, for kiddos um, and for families that otherwise wouldn't be able to get to us. Roxanne, uh, what is your favorite happy hour in Kansas City? All right, I'm gonna say for a happy hour, it's the Barrio at Redbridge because that's where uh, OneScope is located and we can walk to it. And we have done that many times. Fantastic, love that answer. <laughs> and finally, what is your favorite nonprofit connect resource? Um, my favorite nonprofit connect resource, you know, I think it's all of the institutes. Um, I did the uh, executive director institute and I thought it was fabulous because the food was really good. Um, but the actual training was good. The food was also <laughs> really good. Um, I know that my director of operations did the management institute. Um, our development director did the fundraising institute and our communications director is right now in the midst of the marketing institute. And they are so that they just are really, really strong. I think the resources, the information and the learning that happens, but it's also the connections. So it's really unfortunate because the um, uh, my director of operations was able to do it in person and fund development and communications, they're doing it virtually. So you kind of miss the um, being able to connect with the others. But I still have, I think, three uh, executive directors that I connected with at the Institute that we that I still we reach out to each other every now and again um, if we have questions or, or grab a coffee. Um, and just visit. And so that, I think the institutes are invaluable. The virtual folks are missing out on the great food. Darn. <laughs> like even uh, my director of Matt, who's at operations, I like, got the first time when he, the first week came back, he's like, man, that was meatloaf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. was, like, was it paros or something? But he was like, and he really likes food. He's like, yeah. this is the best. Like, we I take know. great pride in our catering at Nonprofit it Connect. Is really <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Roxanne, it has been lovely chatting with you today. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us and telling us a little bit about the Wonderscope Children's Museum. And to our Nonprofit Connect members, thank you for tuning in. We are so glad that you were able to learn a little bit more with us about Roxanne and Wonderscope Children's Museum. And just remember, together we are better. Have a great day.